I would now like to introduce Tom Remington, who is with the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Tom will be our moderator and will kick off the webinar. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Mary. Um, before or to get started, I wanted to sort of talk about how we got here um, to where you're get, getting to hear five scientific presentations on sage grouse that are at a, at a scale we've probably not seen before. In 2012, Region 6 um, science team put together a proposal and sought national uh, Fish and Wildlife Service funding for an inter-LCC sage grouse uh, effort. And in that proposal, which was um, the paradigm was developed by Steve Torbett and Greg Watson, they spoke to a paradigm shift in sage grouse management where we would see collaboration among management entities at range-wide and LCC scales, where we'd see better coordination of planning and implementation that would reduce redundancy and, and better target efforts to high priorities. We would see management informed by science-based decision support tools, and we would see sage grouse data being shared uh, among all parties through a common data portal being LC map. And they envision WAFLA as the appropriate entity to lead these collaborative efforts. So they developed a contract with WAFLA, and I was on, brought on board to coordinate this effort. And the collaboration started with the original oversight committee of uh, 23 individuals with science or, and sage grouse expertise or responsibility. There were six state division of wildlife sage grouse biologists, researchers, five LCC science coordinators, seven other federal biologists from four different agencies, three university professors, and two WAFLA, uh, Sam Stiver and myself, that helped coordinate it. And this oversight committee developed and distributed the RFP and developed scoring criteria consistent with the original proposal. The RFP was issued and it called for projects that would have a meaningful impact to sage-grouse conservation in the short term. Work had to be completed by 30 September 2015. Envision projects that were large scale, at least at the scale of a single LCC, ideally across multiple LCCs or even range wide. The research could fill data gaps, uh, could be mapping, could be development of decision support tools or adaptive management constructs, could evaluate effectiveness of current management, uh, a really a broad spectrum of potential projects. The caveat was that data had to be available through the LC map portal and, and uh, reports with appropriate protections allowed for sensitive data. We received 42 proposals requesting 5.13 million, so a lot of interest out there. We had uh, one-tenth of that, about 500,000 available, so there was a lot of competition for these dollars. The projects were reviewed and ranked by 13 of the oversight committee members who had the time to do so, and ultimately funding was awarded to four projects. There were a few revisions along the way. Uh, Mike Gregg had developed a proposal to look at cheatgrass suppressive soil bacteria and requested a relatively small amount of money in a big project. He was ultimately unable to obtain the permits he needed to do the treatments on the ground in time to uh, meet our, our deadline. So ultimately that project was withdrawn and we uh, issued a second RFP to um, projects that had ranked highly but weren't funded in the original round, and Colin Homer and Matt Bobo's project on annual grass cover mapping came out of that process, and you'll hear from Colin today on that. And finally, at the, uh, as the deadline for listing came close, it became obvious that we needed some science relative to how one should analyze greater sage grouse select counts, there were some, a variety of competing uh, models out there for this that were uh, at odds with each other, and we really thought it would be desirable to have an independent look by a firm that was highly respected throughout the West and um, by both sides of the aisle, if you will. We had some administrative funds uh, that were left over, so we uh, awarded a contract to West Incorporated to do that work, and you'll hear from Ryan um, today as well. So without further ado, let me move on to our first presentation. Today is Sage Grouse Hate Trees, a range-wide solution for increasing bird benefits through accelerated conifer removal, which will be presented by Dr. Michael Falkowski, who is at the University of Minnesota, 
when this research began, but is now a professor at Colorado State. And go ahead, Mike. All right, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Mary. Um, I assume everyone can hear me. I took my mute button off. Uh, so Tom already gave the, the title of my talk. I don't need to reiterate that. Um, as you said, I'm at Colorado State University now. I did all this work, most of this work. And I should say we did most of this work when I was still at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and I have several collaborators on the project that I'd like to thank before I forget. Um, Aaron Poznanovich, who is a technician in my lab, did a lot of the, the heavy lifting in terms of the geospatial work on this project. And then we worked in close collaboration with uh, Dave Noggle and Jeremy Maestas of NRCS uh, and the Sage Grouse Initiative. And also Christian Hagen from OSU and the Lesser Prairie Chicken Initiative. Uh, as well as Jeff Evans and other collaborators at the Nature Conservancy, and then more recently, Brady Allred at the University of Montana is helping us get some of these products distributed um, through various other means. Um, so I'll, I want to start the talk today. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. I want to start the talk today by just going over a little bit about the context and the motivation for this work. And so I really got involved in all this work uh, not that long ago, but it was back in 2013 when I was part of a team. Um, it was an SGI-funded project uh, led by the Nature Conservancy uh, where we were looking at the effect of different geospatial attributes at landscape scales on uh, sage-grouse luck activity. And a couple of important things came out of that work. Uh, we compared uh, uh, probability of lect activity at landscape scales to several potential explanatory uh, variables, including sagebrush cover, uh, conifer cover uh, of invasive trees, uh, the spatial configuration of those trees, their crown diameters, uh, proximity to human activity, uh, so on and so forth. And one of the most important drivers that came out of that work was this uh, conifer canopy cover layer that we had generated for this initial pilot study. And basically what we showed was that conifer cover, something's beeping, is that me? Um, conifer cover uh, above 4% essentially equated to uh, a decrease in uh, lack activity to uh, near zero. And you can see that in this graph here. Um, next slide, Tom. So that was the initial study. And more recently, there has been some work done, and I'm going to show two different studies, or maybe three different studies that are in review right now um, with some folks uh, that had looked at other things besides luck activity and the influence of conifer canopy cover on there uh, on the uh, impacts on stage grouse. And here's an ex example of some work that was led by John Severson at the University of Idaho in the Warner Mountains of Oregon. And they looked at the probability of nest sites being located in landscapes with varying amounts of juniper cover. And what they found was uh, that sage grouse were ne negatively affected uh, by even low uh, levels of conif conifer cover. And specifically in this graph, you can see that there's a low probability of nests being located in areas that have over 3% conifer cover uh, within the surrounding landscape. And in this case, they were looking at sites within 800 meters of the nest site. Next slide, Tom. It's also worth pointing out that this is not a single species management issue. And again, here's another paper that's in review um, where Aaron Holmes, also in the Warner Mountains, looked at the influence of conifer treatments on uh, songbird uh, abundance in different areas. And basically what he found was uh, the abundance of two different sagebrush obligates increased uh, in the years following conifer removal treatments. And you can see those in the red and blue lines on this graph here. And then also he looked at uh, uh, um, the gray flycatcher, which is a songbird that prefers open woodlands, and not surprisingly, that bird actually decreased following conifer removal treatments. So this really uh, demonstrates that there are positive impacts on both sage grouse as well as other uh, non-sage grouse sagebrush obligates, and that those uh, impacts, those positive impacts, happen fairly quickly after treatment. Next slide, Tom. Um, and just one more example. Um, to try to bolster the case for whether or not conifer removal actually works. So here's another example from John Severson at the University of Idaho. And we can see, um, without going into too much detail on their paper, we can see that conifer removal has a positive impact on sage grouse. So this analysis was also conducted in the Warner Mountains of Oregon, and they de demonstrated multiple positive effects on conifer removal uh, in on uh, sage grouse. So just a couple of bullet points here. They saw a 28% increase in available nesting habitat 
uh, following cuts. Uh, they saw a 22% annual increase in the probability of use of a newly treated site. Um, and then uh, hens were 43% more likely to nest within 1,000 meters of treatments as compared to areas farther away from treatments. And then they also observed that a significant number of marked birds moved into treated habitats fairly quickly after removal. So um, again, this was just providing a little context for the motivation of the work. The, the studies that I mentioned um, so far are all included in a forthcoming special issue in rangeland ecology and management that focuses on prairie grass conservation. So keep your eyes open for that. So clearly conifer encroachment has negative impacts on sage grouse and conifer removal seems to have positive impacts on sage grouse as well as other sagebrush obligates. As a result, at the uh, Sage Grouse Initiative and other agencies have been very active in removing invading conifers across the landscape. And so here's a landscape in Oregon where we have, uh, uh, this is before treatment, before removal. Next slide, Tom. And here's what it looks like one year after conifer removal, so big difference. And so you can, you can imagine that when we consider conifer removal treatments in the context of the entire sage grouse range, uh, that it can be very difficult to decide how and where to prioritize and place treatments for conifer removals. So budgets are limited and thus effective placements and prioritization of conifer treatments is critical to success. Next slide, Tom. So based on this initial work, uh, we submitted a proposal and we really, the, the, our main objective was to um, develop a, a tool or a data product, a geospatial tool that can better understand the distribution and density of conifer across the entire St. Drouse range. Um, so, Oh, I guess a little over two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, we were funded to conduct a range-wide conifer mapping, um, which was completed a couple of months ago. We completed uh, mapping over 102 million acres within both sage-grouse priority area conservation areas and sage-grouse occupied range. Um, and since then, we've also conducted some additional mapping. We did, did some more areas in Montana. We've done some more areas in Colorado, and we also have Wyoming in progress. Uh, next slide, Tom. Without going too much into the detail on the specific methods we used, I just want to conceptually talk about what we did and how it works. And so you can imagine, uh, well, here we have a NAEP image that shows the distribution of conifer within this particular area. This is actually in Oregon. Uh, and you can imagine that ideally, a, a mapping approach that identifies the size and location of every tree would be ideal. So by size, I mean crown diameter. Next slide, Tom. Um, and it turns out we can actually use some image processing techniques to extract not only the location, but the size of conifer trees in any given landscape. Uh, and so this is uh, one subset of output from our approach. Um, I, I don't actually show the size of conifer trees here. I'll show that in the next slide. Um, but you can see that we're doing fairly well in determining uh, where the trees are on the landscape, especially at low canopy covers, which are uh, uh, critically important to uh, consider in the context of tree, uh, conifer removal treatments. Next slide, Tom. So here's another view. Um, this is actually a NAEP-derived NDVI image. So we took a four-band uh, NAEP image, made an NDVI image, and this is just showing you some output from our mapping approach uh, at two different uh, spatial scales. So if you look at the right-hand pane zoomed in, you can see that we've mapped the location and size of individual trees from that NDVI image. And you can see it's not perfect. Uh, we do really well in areas where we have low canopy cover, so we have individual trees isolated, but where you get more dense uh, patches of conifer, there are some errors. Um, but in, in general, it, it works very, very well, and it's by far uh, better than anything we have or have had to date. Uh, next slide, Tom. So this is just another view. This is a four-band NAEP image, false color composite on the left. In the middle, we have our, our uh, image analysis-derived conifer uh, locations and crown diameters. And we can use that to calculate all sorts of different metrics. Uh, the most important one that we've been generating is canopy cover. So we can run a moving window over that particular output and calculate conifer cover within a moving window. So this is actually on the right-hand side, conifer cover per acre. And we've delivered a classified product, but we can also, and we do also calculate a continuous conifer canopy cover product that ranges from zero to 100%. And there's other things we could calculate. We could calculate tree density by summarizing the number of trees. We could look at the spatial distribution of trees within a, in a given area. We could look at their uh, ground 
diameter statistics to get an idea of size. Um, so that should give you an idea about uh, the basics of how our process works and what the outputs are. Uh, next slide, Tom. So this is the final uh, map. Now, as I said, um, a couple of things I want to point out here. Wyoming is in progress. Um, we've produced this classified conifer cover. Um, it's available on, well, portions of it are currently available on LC map right now. Everything will be on, available on LC map eventually. Um, and we have another data delivery method, which I'll show you in a second here. Uh, but this really presents the first range-wide view of the conifer encroachment problem, and it hopefully it will prove to be a very powerful conservation tool. Uh, there are many potential applications for this, as you can imagine. I will specifically uh, spend a couple of minutes talking about two different applications we've been using this for. Uh, the first is using it as a tracking tool, so we can evaluate where the cuts are taking place across multiple spatial scales, so from local scales to landscape scales to regional scales, and then we can measure uh, the progress, management progress in the context of different conifer cover threat levels or canopy covers. And we can really use it as a means to identify whether or not we're hitting the right areas, if there's areas we're missing. Um, and that leads into sort of the second thing we've been doing with it most recently is using it as a targeting tool. So given that budgets are limited, can we use this to spatially explicit, uh, can we use a spatially explicit conifer cover information in combination with other geospatial data to evaluate and determine optimal placement and configuration of conifer removal treatments across landscapes to regions? Next slide. Very briefly, just also want to point out that we've done this also for LPCCI, the Lesser Prairie Chicken Initiative, and mapped uh, eastern red cedar encroachment in the areas that you see mapped or displayed here. I'm not going to spend any time on that. Next slide, please. So here's an example. Uh, this is actually in a paper we have in review in range ecology and management uh, right now where we introduced this tool, but then also talked about this potential use as a targeting tool or a tracking tool of tracking of progress. So on the left here, we have the conifer cover map in the reds and greens and yellows. Uh, overlaid on top are the locations of SGI conifer removal projects. Um, in the states you see here, and they're scaled according to their size, um, all the way from zero to uh, 4,300 hectare. Um, and on the right, we summarized that data in Oregon and looked at only looked at SGI-sponsored cuts on private lands in areas above 4% canopy cover. So areas above 4% canopy cover were classifying as risk in this situation, and that's derived from the kind of cover map. And so just some quick stats in five years, uh, SGIs removed uh, I think it's actually closer to a half million acres now um, with all virtually all removals occurring within populations where conifer uh, is a widespread threat according to the maps. Um, and then using these maps, we can also calculate the ratio between the area of conifer above 4% to the total area of conifer removed. Um, and by doing that, we can show that the, the SGI alone has uh, reduced private land threat by nearly 70%. Um, and so you can imagine when we start to combine this information with what's going on on public lands, uh, you can imagine this would be a really powerful tool for uh, tracking progress. Um, next slide, Tom. So this slide should have been my last one. It got out of order somehow, but I'll cover it here. So um, if these data are being delivered via LC map, but we also have on SGI's website a data uh, uh, area for viewing data and also downloading data. Um, you can link to it off SGI's website or you could email me after the presentation and I could send you um, uh, the link to the file or the website. But basically the bottom line is conservation no longer has to be site-based. Products as this can facilitate, uh, facilitate conservation at broad spatial scales. And I want to cover, uh, I've got three more slides to cover this optimization work. Four more slides. Next slide, Tom. Um, real quick. So we can also use this conifer mapping tool to optimize the spatial location of conifer treatments across the landscape and perhaps across regions, um, depending on our specific objectives. So here's some example. Here's an example of some analysis I've, um, that we're doing uh, right now, where we're integrating the conifer data with other geospatial data in a modeling framework to optimize the spatial location of conifer cuts across different spatial scales. Next slide, Tom. We're using a, a landscape modeling approach called MarkSAM. Don't want to get into too many details on that, but basically we can put in uh, different conservation features and different cost terms into a model uh, 
to identify areas uh, in this modeling framework that, that based on how we weight these factors, uh, we would consider priority kind of for removal areas. So in terms of conservation features, we're inputting sage-grouse select populations, uh, sage-grouse habitat suitability uh, model developed by Kevin Doherty, uh, sage-grouse de density from land fire, um, and then in terms of cost, we're putting in the conifer layer that I just talked about, and then we're also putting in this resistance and resilience uh, layer, soil resistance and re resilience layer developed by Jeremy Maestas. Three different levels of modeling. First, we're looking at identifying areas of priority conifer removal within individual sage-grouse packs, uh, and then we're going to do some connectivity analysis where we looked at how we could potentially connect uh, lex with brooding habitat um, by uh, including this information and looking at cuts along corridors, perhaps to open up connectivity between those two habitats. And then also at regional scales, we're looking at removing conifer or prioritizing conifer removals between uh, individual or individual packs across the entire region. Next slide. I'll be real quick here. I think I'm getting low on time. Um, so this is just an overview of our, our uh, pilot study of this analysis in Oregon. Next slide, we'll zoom in. And what this shows is we basically run the model 1,000 times with all those different layers in there. And every time one of these hexagon grids shows up in the model, we, as being a priority area, we take a, we take a mark. So these, these dark blue areas are indicating areas where the model believes, according to the factors we put into it and the weights we've set, um, where uh, these areas are priority areas for removal. And so if you think about this, it, it really makes sense in a biological context. If you look at where these darker blue hexagons are, are being placed by the model, um, they're areas of lower canopy cover um, on the fringes of denser canopy covers um, in areas that are actually near areas with large amounts of sagebrush uh, and closer to lex. So if you think about this from um, maximizing return on investment, you know, these are the areas that you're more likely to get a quicker return on, on investing in kind of removal projects. Um, and so I, I believe, and again, this is just initial that this modeling approach, at least at this within pack scale is making uh, pretty good uh, decisions. And so, as I said, this is uh, objective one and we have not started the other two objectives, but we're working on them uh, soon. So uh, next slide, Tom. So thanks. Uh, just. Uh, we had multiple different funding sources uh, for this. So I'd like to, without mentioning them by name, direct you to the slide here. And then also special thanks to the Nature Conservancy for all their support on this work as well. Okay, thank you, Mike. And you were uh, spot on on time. So thank you for staying within your time. And I'll apologize for the misorder. That was apparently an import error on my end. Hopefully- No, I think it was my, my fault, so. Well, I had a duplicate, so I'm fairly certain it was mine. But at any rate, uh, we're going to ask you to hold your, not hold your questions, go ahead and send them to Mary, but we'll uh, deal with the questions at the end of the presentation to so make sure everybody has uh, time to give theirs. So we'll move to our second presentation, which is uh, designing a regional network of fuel breaks to protect greater sage-grouse habitat and experimental approach using circuitscape. And it will be presented by Dr. Louis Provencher. Director of Conservation Ecology for the Nature Conservancy out of Reno, uh, Nevada. And will we make sure your mute is off, please? Can you hear me, Tom? I can, thanks. Wonderful. So um, in this project, there was Nathan Welsh, who uh, did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of technical work. It was myself, I was the PI, but by no means did I do all the heavy uh, lifting. It was Bob Unash, Tanya Anderson, and Brad McRae with our North American program with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, next slide. Um, there's several documents out there. This one happens to be from Montana, where the document on sage-grouse management says quite clearly and as a high priority, you, we recommend putting in fuel breaks to stop these, these large uncharacteristic wildfires that some take away nesting habitat primarily for sage grouse. So you, there's several documents like this. Helps the firefighters hold the line or it just stops the fire. Next slide, please. So given that there's not just one, but many of these documents that says that proposed as a first solution to putting fuel breaks, um, we actually decide to create a method. We, the 
basically a method that's affordable. It was really important to us because we wanted other people to be able to use it. A GIS method, and there's more to it than just GIS, that allows us to define where could we put strategic fuel breaks on the landscape to protect sage grouse habitat. And that was our primary goal. And I'll show you how we went about doing this. Uh, next slide. We focus on the Hawaii uplands, an important um, area that's in Idaho, Nevada, Oregon, and some of it spills kind of into the Box Elder County area of uh, Northwest Utah. So it's a, I, I don't remember exactly the acreage, but I know it was at least like 26 million acres or something like that. It's it's pretty big area. So it's the Fish and Wildlife Service, Northern Great Basin area, it's called 2A. The Box Elder population was in there too. So we decided we took an area that was fairly large and we ran with that. Next slide, please. So what we were simulating was wildfire transmission and fuel break potential uh, using software CircuitScape to do this. CircuitScape is a wildlife dispersal software. So if you want to know if an animal goes from point A to B with a certain probability, you may use different platforms, but CircuitScape does that. And it basically uses electrical circuit theory, so ohms, voltage, current, and all that to move animals. And we decided, well, instead of moving animals, we're going to move fire on the landscape using this. And that was just, we decided to do an out-of-the-box application of the software. So this software has um, electrical current enters the, enters the area through sources so sources, when you say sources, you think of lightning strikes or human ignition. And grounds are at the edge of the landscape, and grounds allowed us to actually attract fire to imitate prevailing winds on the landscape. And the resistance surface, so the resistance to fire, is defined by what we call the flammability raster. So we had to come up with all of these things. And base, remember, we're talking about the electricity here. We're imitating, we're, we're using theory on electricity to imitate the behavior of fire. So we had to do some adjustments for that. We were going to talk about pinch points. Pinch points are area where the fire, the wildfire transmission probability is very high. And these pinch points for us become targets for putting fuel breaks that will prevent the fire from going there and going downwind and burning sage grouse habitat. Next slide. While we were doing this, uh, this came out uh, in Ecological Application 2015. So Miranda Gray and Brett Dixon used CircuitScape to model fire behavior in the Sonoran Desert. So someone thought that actually this is pretty innovative and good method to use. So uh, this, this is, you can go read it because basically the, the basics of what we covered are actually covered in this paper too. So it's very similar. We did some other things to our application that were more they're kind of unusual. We had to do that. We didn't have a choice, so that would be a difference. Uh, next slide, please. So what you're seeing here is the landscape to which we added a 30-kilometer buffer. And the buffer is the ex it goes all the way out to this exterior of the, the shape area. And in it, you see a bunch of 10,000 dots. Each dot is an ignition point, a lightning strike. You can think of it that way. And you see the buffer there with the dotted line. And then you see a blue line on the northeast edge, and that is the ground. So when a lightning hits a spot there, the electrons or the fire try to travel towards the ground. What this does, it allows us to create a direction for prevailing winds. So every electron is going to try to go to the ground. So we're forcing, that's how we do the prevailing winds in this case. Next slide, please. Next one. So in order to have this work, you have to create the resistance layer. And this took a, this took a lot of time to do all these, how to figure out how to do this in a way that was not too complicated, that could be used readily by the agencies that used available data out there. First thing we did, we took the land fire data for ecological systems and, and vegetation classes, 
And for each pixel, so we're working, working at 30 meter resolution. Later we'll resample to 270 meters just for reasons of memory space and capacity of software. But for each 30 meter pixel, we assign a fire return interval to that pixel based on the land fire data. So we extracted all the vegetation layer and also the existing vegetation land fire has different vegetation layers. And for example, we're able to determine something is Wyoming sage for us. It has a shrub cover and it has cheatgrass in it. You can actually tell some of these things from this or it's an annual grassland. And my job for this was to assign that fire return tool to every single pixel in that landscape, which I did. This takes actually quite a bit of time to do this. But what you see there are the fire turn intervals and they translate directly to resistance, electrical resistance in the software. And the bigger the number, the greener the color, the more likely you are to be standing in a playa or in greasewood or an alfalfa field. And the more purple, dark purple the color, the more likely you are to be in an annual grassland or something. Actually, an annual grassland is probably your best bet. Next slide, please. So we had to modify this raster because the information in Landfire was based on imagery from up to 2004, maybe a lot of 2000, 2001. So there's, it's, in some areas, it's outdated, although the imagery we used was the most recent version, I think the 2014 release in August of Landfire. So we had the most up-to-date version, but we had to modify it. So to do that, the USGS just happened to have published the maximum cheatgrass abundance index, and we actually translated the index to what we were known to, co to known cover values of cheatgrass. So for example, we take the land fire data and it's Wyoming with shrubs, or it's just a Wyoming late successional class, a reference class, but the US just said in this class, there's a ton of cheatgrass. Then we change the name of the vegetation class in land fire, and we change the fire return to both as a consequence of that. So this is the first modification of the land fire data to make this more current for our application. Uh, next slide, please. This is the old and new fires. And uh, the older fires were probably, and we're pretty sure we're incorporated in the land fire data. So you can tell the younger successional vegetation or the annual grasslands. But the old, the newer fires were not. So what we did, we took from we used MTBS and we used the federal fire occurrence data and we uh, map, put those on the, the, the GIS layer and we decided whatever was there before burned and became probably an annual grassland. So we were very pessimistic living in this part of the world. And so we converted to an annual grassland because we really don't know if it went to a mix of perennial and annual grasses or perennial. Well, we went towards the more pessimistic view of the world. Other systems don't do that. And if you burn an aspen stand, it just goes to early succession aspen. So we didn't, those were easy to do. And given this, then it, if these recent fires became annual grassland, then we had a fire return to hold of five to 10 years or something like that. So we, we, this allowed us further to modify the fire return interval. Next slide, please. People suggested that we use the heat load index to actually provide a, a multiplier for this. And the, the idea is that the, the redder the color and the more loaded you are in the heat load index or the higher your index, the more likely you probably have dry fuels that will burn. And people suggest we do that. So we created a little multiplier that multiply, actually a multiplier that decreased the fire turn interval. So if you're in a high heat load index area, you're more likely to burn if you are not. And it's a small correction that was associated with the calculation of the resistance value right there. It was a small transformation, but it was important. Next slide, please. And from this, we obtained the final um, resistance value. So this is a, a very modified fire return interval. At this point, it does not equal anymore to a fire return interval. It's a modification of it, but it's rather close to it. And with this, this is what we use. We fed this to the CircuitScape software. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. So what you see here is the first run of CircuitScape. In red are the fire trans the highest intensity fire transmission corridors. And you can see where the pitch points are. And the bluer the area, the less likely that burns. So a lot of the greasewood and alfalfa fields and the snake plains and all that are, you know, they're blue. 
what you have in this figure that's really important detail, this is the fire transmission given that we incorporate the effects of major roads on the fire behavior. So the major roads acted as fuel brakes themselves, and we associate a negative current to them. So if a fire came to one of these major paved or county-maintained roads, it absorbs some of the fire in it through negative current. This was a pain in the neck to calibrate, but Nathan did a good job of it. If, I, if we did not incorporate the effect of the roads on this, this image would be much redder. There would be a whole lot more fire in it than it is now. So this, the road effect, before any fuel breaks, other fuel breaks, was to cool the landscape. And you see the red areas are where the fire is most likely to travel in this landscape. Next slide, please. Next slide. So to explain this a little bit, imagine that you have in yellow the big field of annual grassland, just cheap grass. Maybe you have Medusa head in there if you want additional nightmare in your life. And then you have um, a point A and B, and B is downwind from A. And then you have to the right a lek in green. Uh, so we're going to move fire in there. Next slide. And basically, this is a bunch of electrons emitting fire going through the landscape following the, towards the ground, following the prevailing winds. And basically, you can predict pretty much that one day your lek will burn. And if it's cheatgrass, they will probably burn in the next 10 years in the nesting habitat around the lek. Next slide, please. Now, let's assume that you put two alfalfa fields right there. And next slide. And now you do the same exercise. What will happen is that the electrons will go around the alfalfa field and create this corridor of high fire transmission. And less, your, your, your leg will probably burn again. So what's important is that the electrons still travel. If you have 10,000 electrons on one side, you'll get 10,000 electrons on the other side, unless you, knew, you use negative current to absorb some of these electrons through a fuel break, in which that's one of the innovations we did with this project. So uh, where the letter B is, that's where you would go put a fuel break and try to absorb some of those electrons or, you know, fire coming through. Next slide, please. So we're back to our landscape with the roads effects in it. And uh, next slide, please. And here are the, breed, uh, the lacking areas. So basically what we did we didn't want to put fuel brakes all over creation, so we decided we're going to put fuel brakes upwind of these red areas where the 25% the uh, breeding density areas that's proposed by paper by Dorothy and all. So we decided let's use the same information the agency uses. We're trying to protect those red areas and, the trend, and put the pinch, find the pinch points that are upwind from those red areas predominantly. Next slide, please. So here the we put fuel brakes, they're not activated at this point. So you see these purple lines and these red areas? Those are where we decide to do fuel brakes following roads. We did not run fuel brakes in the middle of nesting habitat or on, you know, if they're standing sage rush and it's happy and fine, we did not touch it. What we did is that we put the fuel brakes along existing county maintained roads or paved roads. Now we're gonna, and there's 13 of these fuel brakes in there. Now I'm gonna, we're gonna turn on the current, on the, on the negative current on these fuel brakes. Next slide, please. Here we have fuel brakes of moderate permeability. So basically we have a base level of negative current that is just found in the fuel brake. And if you wanna understand this with a Star Trek type of comparison, the current that's coming is, a, is like matter. And the fuel break is like antimatter. And when the matter and the antimatter meet, there's a void. And that's how we treat the fuel breaks. Negative current, it's positive current flowing through the landscape, hitting a negative current barrier, and the current is absorbed. That's why we use 10,000 ignition sources, because we're sucking out current out of this landscape. If you put too few of these ignition lights points, nothing goes across the landscape. It all gets absorbed, especially since you have roads in there, too. So now I'm going to increase the, I'm going to decrease the permeability of the fuel brake. So this is a pretty ordinary fuel brake, and now I'm going to make it more pretty serious fuel brake. Next slide, please. You've got about five minutes left, Louis. Okay, I'm nearly done. Next slide. And what you see here, there's a lot of this that the fire. This was actually an effective level of fuel brake where we actually stop. And Tom, you can go to the previous slide and come back so people can see the difference between them. <laughs> 
really rapid. Yeah. Moderate, less. Okay, go forward. So basically, we stop. We stopped a lot of the fires, the wildfire transmission. We're not modeling fire. Just a reminder: we're not modeling fire. We're modeling fire transmission. So we're not doing fire size and all that. It's a likelihood that the fire will go there. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the the, the areas of concern with the fuel breaks in it, stage house areas. So just to remind people, these are based on lecking areas, lek densities. Next slide. I'm going to skip this one, just go to the next slide. Uh, so we're following this. There's some, there's some groups, there's three at least groups that approach us to apply this at their scale in their, in their areas with real fuel breaks and all that, and we're pursuing that. We also pursue, we would like to pursue some, uh, some aspects of imitating more realistically fire. So that will be done one day, hopefully. So we're moving forward with that. And the next, I think the final slide is probably the rubber duckies. So oh, acknowledgements for Fish and Wildlife, Wafa and Fish and Wildlife Service. And Elaine York and Jay Kirby from Nature Conservancy in their respective states that helped us with agency contacts. Next slide. And imagine these are the electrons, firons, and they're moving across your landscape. So when you think about it, this is what you're seeing. I'm done. Okay, thanks, Louis. I noticed Mal here was in the middle of a red area. Imagine that. Uh, let's move on to uh, our next presentation, keeping with the remote sensing theme, uh, characterization of shrub grass components across the West with remote sensing, new opportunities for habitat and trend analysis by Dr. Colin Homer, who is the land characterization project chief for USGS Eros, with, which is Earth Resources Observation Systems Data Center. And uh, it differs a little bit from what was uh, originally projected. The annual grass cover piece that WAFO funded was a relatively small part of a much broader habitat mapping project. And he's going to tell us about the whole uh, project, not just the piece that we funded. So Colin, take it from here. Okay, thanks, Tom. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm assuming you'll be showing the presentation. Okay, there we go. Yeah, hi everyone. As Tom mentioned, uh, I've changed the title here a little bit uh, from the Waffle one that, that he gave you. I, I thought the group would appreciate a little more context about what our what our work is, what's going on here. I will circle back to some more sage grouse and sagebrush stuff, but I thought it would be good to kind of kind of lay that lay lay this out a, a little more more broad. So next slide, please. So what, what I'm going to talk about here, let me just give you a brief overview of what we're going to cover. I'm going to talk about remote sensing components, so a little bit of what they are and how we create them. I'm going to talk about where we're at with the current results and, and try to bring you up to speed on that a little bit. But I also want to spend a little time talking about uh, some examples of how they can be used, some ap application examples. And as I mentioned, we'll circle back to some sage grouse uh, sagebrush ones, and then talk about the products we are we are working on and some of the future possibilities of how we envision uh, this laying out. And if you've been able to endure all that, I'll tell you at the end how to get a hold of them. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge right up front, this is a big team effort. Uh, uh, 12 to 15 folks are involved, so I can't, can't take time to individually call them out. It's being done at three different USGS centers here includes a lot of USGS and BLM funding as well. Okay, next slide. So uh, in case you haven't been introduced to fractional vegetation components, some, kind of, some call them continuous fields, I just want to make sure you have the right picture in your head of what I'm talking about here. So look at this cartoon here, and if you can imagine this is a one meter Daubenmeyer frame uh, out in the real world, and I'm sure some of you have done something like, like that where <clears throat> you fractionalize or you measure the different components that are in that frame. So in this example, you about, have about 30% of a, a sagebrush shrub there on the left. You have some herbaceousness, which for uh, uh, our, our efforts here are uh, grass and forb, the lumping those. You have litter, which is dead plant 
material, about 10% in this frame, and you have about 45% of bare ground. So if, if you can imagine just measuring those things in that one meter frame out in the field, what we do with satellites is the exact same thing. Pixels are square. We start scaling that up. And so if you can imagine either a two meter pixel, which I'll talk about, or even a 30 meter pixel on the ground, our products give you the, the estimate of the different fractional components in those uh, individual pixel cells. So that's what I mean by a fractional vegetation component. Next slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the methods. We have pa papers that are out, out there, uh, two or three of those. You can look into that if, if you want to understand a little bit more. But, but essentially, what our method does is take lots of field measurements on the ground in the upper left. We have an intermediate satellite scale that uh, we, we, we scale those to. It usually comes from something like worldview two or three, and it's about a two or two and a half meter pixel. Uh, when you're mapping things like bare ground and very ephemeral types like herbaceousness and those kinds of things, we need coincident satellite and field measurement collection at, at the same time to be effective. We, we really can't use NAEP and some of those other kinds of things. So, so that's why we need that intermediate scale there to basically create uh, what we think of as vegetation or field superplot. So these are like 144 square kilometer chunks of landscape in the middle there that on the bottom right in this example, we've uh, done this in other geographies as well. We can then scale that up to uh, wall to wall at a Landsat 30 meter pixel scale. And at the, at the lower right, at that scale, we use uh, sometimes 50 to 75 independent data layers, uh, including uh, multiple seasons of imagery, sometimes five different dates across the growing season, all kinds of ancillary data layers. And we throw a lot at these regression tree models to get at the, the, the per pixel estimates that I'm going to talk about here. Next slide. So really, that's all I'm going to talk about methods, other than I want, to, want you to visualize a little bit. So uh, especially the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service WAFLA funding, which we're kind of uh, referring to here, here today, uh, that funding especially factored into the sage grouse zone four area and coming up with a better uh, annual grass estimate, uh, which wasn't in the funding at the time. And just to give you kind of a visual look, those little square red chips are where we strategically put these worldview two and three high resolution collects. And they are designed to represent the wall to wall landscape. And so there's a lot of thinking that goes into where we place these. And then that is where my field crews go out and intensively sample those red squares. And then those red squares uh, create the wall to wall model that I'll refer to here. Uh, next slide, Tom. Uh, so this is the current product suite. Um, there is a series of nine uh, components, and uh, we we map all shrub, all sage, and big sage. And of course, those are nested one one in, the, in another. The the sagebrush estimates nest in the all shrub estimates uh, because there is some shadowing from the height of the shrubs. We can make a shrub and a sagebrush height estimate. It's not the best thing in the world, but we recognize that the sort of wall-to-wall -wall landscape scale, it's better than, uh, than nothing. And so, uh, I'll, and I can talk about what the error that is in a minute, but uh, you know, it's, it's certainly a workable estimate at the landscape scale. We make a herbaceous cover estimate, all, all the grass and forb. We also make an annual herbaceous cover estimate. The reason we call it an annual herbaceous cover. It is mostly annual grasses like cheatgrass and medusa head, but it includes some of the annual mustards in and probably some of uh, the native an annuals as well. So it depends a little bit on context where you end up using that. But you know, since we're, we're doing this wall-to-wall -wall effort, there was just no way for us to separate those different annual components out. Uh, you know, we can we can do that locally. We just can't do that across this big of geography here, and then we make a bare ground and a litter estimate. And I just remind you that these product suites, when you get a hold of them, if, if you want to use them, are, the values are in 1% increments of, of what those estimates are from 1 to 100, if that range is applicable. Uh, next slide, Tom. 
So kind of the final slide about the product, if I remember, I just want to talk a little bit about the validation of it. We put a lot of effort into this. There are essentially three different ways you can validate the product. We have an independent validation. So uh, when our field crews are out there getting the training data, we also have a randomized uh, validation protocol uh, where they go to different ge geographies and make validation measurements. We have a cross-validation with all those Worldview 2 and 3 chips. We can use a lot of the data from there that isn't used into training just to give us kind of a working uh, level validation on how well the model is working. So we, we, we provide both of those. And we also provide a spatial absolute air model. Uh, this is our cubist model saying, well, this is what we think the, the air is for each cell for every prediction. So you can go in there and see what the absolute plus or minus air is. And, and we envision this if you're a user that has a geography you have special concern about or you want to know what the pattern of air is, those kinds of things, we make these available as well. Next slide. Some reason it locked up. Let me start over. Here we go. Okay, so this is what the product looks looks like now. Uh, I'll talk about how to get a hold of it. <clears throat> We've had different uh, regions currently available: the the northwest and the north central region there, which uh, this funding was tied to. Uh, but this is a this is the sagebrush component prediction here. We have it available now across the entire Great Basin. And I say the, the root mean square accuracy of this, when I say about 6%, it, little, it depends on which geography or you know, which of those sub-regions that, that you're in. What that means is if uh, our value is 20% sagebrush canopy in a 30-meter cell, you could expect in this case it would be within 14% on the low end, 26% on the high end when you actually went there on the ground. Next slide. And here's the annual herbaceous component estimate. Uh, RMSE root mean square accuracy on this is about plus or minus 7%. Again, that depends where you're at. Just a reminder, these are very ephemeral types again. And so with especially the herbaceous uh, components and bare ground, it makes a difference, of course, what year they're in. So up in the Northwest was done in 2013, the rest done in 2014. And so you'll see a little difference from uh, uh, year differences there. Uh, there are different uh, cheatgrass or annual herbaceous estimates out there. Uh, uh, a collaborative team I work with on the GS side uh, has one out there at the MODA scale, the 250 meter scale. So what's different about this is the higher resolution, the 30 meter scale, and the consistency and the, and the extent of, of the prediction. Next slide. So that just kind of gives you a, a little bit feel of how we get the prod, prod product, the, the nine product suite that's com coming out. I want to spend the rest of the presentation talking about a little bit of how we use it and kind of what our what our vision is. I mean, why why did we do this paradigm here? And, and the main reason why is that it it provides ultimate flexibility in how users are gonna, going going to use these. First with sage grouse, uh, we started uh, prototyping, developing this method in Wyoming many years ago. Have been able to develop and, and, and show there with the Fady et al. paper I've listed here that uh, you can do sage grouse. It, 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 it does offer a new and improved way to do sage grouse habitat modeling. There's current efforts with this current product suite going on in the Great Basin now. Looked at grazing assessments. <clears throat> Uh, looking at the difference between passing and failing on, on land health standard assessments and VACES. I'll show you an example real quick. Spending a lot of time. You know, a lot of the reason we went down this, this path is we needed a better way to monitor these changes across time, especially the kind of gradual change that climate change gives us. So spend a lot of time taking this product suite and showing and demonstrating how you can see climate change as well as some other things that I've, I've shown you there. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now the real the 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 real big advantage of of this component based approach is we can now harvest the Landsat archive at least back to 1983 to start looking at change uh, across time. I've shown a cheatgrass example that we prototyped in Nevada a 
a few years ago, so you can kind of vi visualize how this works, where if you have a current time product, we've developed methods that you can, and we have papers out on this as well, you can, you can push this back in time and come up with a pretty reliable estimate back in time of what the change across time has been in, in this. And here's, a, here's an example of that in the cheatgrass example. Next slide. And here's an example with climate change. Now, there is climate change happening out there. So if you look at that, that red square, that's a Landsat path row in northwest Nevada, kind of southeast Oregon. Look at the two graphs at the bottom. One's precipitation on the left. So in that geography, in that red box, we're seeing a slight precipitation loss across time, across about 30, <clears throat> 30 35 years. And what's more pronounced is we're seeing temperature going up. So there's the minimum temperature going up across this landscape across time. Research has shown that species like sagebrush are especially vulnerable to this kind of change. Well, the, and, and then above that are the, the five different components that we've mapped back in time to, to this same time period as the climate variables on the bottom. And you can see the response uh, shrub cover for some reason didn't didn't come out. That's upper left. The title on that you'll see the shrub and sagebrush are declining across time, litter and herbaceous uh, as as well. And then as you'd expect, bare ground is going up. So we are seeing a vegetation. And I might add those responses there are just on pixels that have had climate change effect. So we take all the fire off the landscape and all all those kinds of things. So we are seeing an effect. <coughs> across time from, from these kinds of things. Well, circling back to sage grouse and sagebrush, next slide, Tom. Uh, here's a Wyoming example, you know, and I, I might add, this is an area where we don't expect climate change to have as much effect on sage grouse habitat overall, but it still is affecting it here. You see, again, see the same pattern, upper right, the precipitation, you know, these are very erratic systems, we acknowledge that, but the downward trend is for the precipitation going down upper right, lower left is our sagebrush component change every year back in time, same downward trend. And then we can come up with linear regression models that, uh, that model the relationship, basically come up with a slope of this kind of relationship. And then next slide. That slope then gives us a way to project in the future. Again, this is for every 30 meter cell, what, what the, the ultimate component amount will be into the future based on different climate projection scenarios. Now, if you're a manager, one of the things that we've heard frustration wise on any climate change model is the lack of their ability to articulate what we think will happen at a patch based scale. And so I just wanted to make the point, the reason we can push this so far down at the 30 meter level and, and, and we have a paper to add on this is, is, I mean, the reason that we're doing this is, is, is try to localize climate change to a sign of kind of a patch based scale so we can really uh, inform some of our future management with this kind of work. So if we do this kind of thing into the future then, next slide. About five minutes, Colin. Okay. <clears throat> We can then apply it to sage grass. So we can look out into the future as in this study here, again in the state of Wyoming and, and look at, well, if, if we're gonna see this kind of habitat or we see this kind of component change, what does it mean from a habitat point of view in this example, sage grass nesting habitat, we saw about 11% loss. And so uh, you can you know say at first glance, 11% doesn't sound like a whole lot, but if there's other change drivers on the landscape, it could be the amount that puts things over the threshold. Next slide. So what are our re research goals? We really wanna tell the story of, of change with every uh, Landsat 30 meter pixel in the West. We wanna characterize its components. I've already talked about how we're doing that. We're uh, now looking at ways to score the intactness of the pixel against what we think the site potential would have it at, in, uh, in other words, to look for where's the good stuff left. Uh, look at how much the pixel has changed since 1983 and look at what's causing the chain, what, what's, what's the driver. We especially want to key in on what's, what's climate doing and what's it going to do. And then also look at other future, future trends and then come up with better ways to communicate the, 
results and sort of interactive data kinds of maps. Next slide. After the 2000 field, uh, 2016 field season coming up, I wanted to show you these are the geographies that, that will have been field assessed and satellite collected. There's probably a six or eight month lag in the actual modeling being done and posted. The red are our high resolution, you know, 144 square kilometer satellite chips that we field sample. Just wanted to show you the black is our independent val validation plots as well. So you just can kind of get some sense of that. But that's how much geography will be done at the end of the field season here, and we plan to complete the rest of the mountain areas. You can see we focus is on the, on the lower elevation, more sh uh, shrub and, and, and grassland dom dom dominated system. Next slide. This is my last slide. So uh, lower right is the website. Uh, this is not out on LC, LC map. Uh, we deemed it well, well enough that it was out on this website. You can go to mrlc.gov. I just wanted to make the point that some of these products have been out there uh, for quite some time. Some of you might have downloaded those. We have pulled those to now edge match uh, uh, these, these regions that have been done. That will be reposted about the middle of the month. So if, if you've downloaded the sub-region areas, would encourage you to come back and download the entire mosaic region uh, in the middle of the month. And then just also wanted to make the point, this is, <clears throat> you know, we hear, we, we hear, we hear uh, enough examples about bad government. This is an example of good government here, where for 15 years, we've had 10 federal agencies collaborating in a consortium to bring you, bring you the national land cover da database and other data layers as well. The neat thing about all these uh, shrub grass, bare ground products I've talked about is we have institutionalized you know, those under that umbrella, which means they're likely to persist. So for monitoring and other kinds of uh, things, it gives us some databases to work with into the future. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Colin, and did very well on time. Uh, Ryan Nielsen, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Ryan Nielsen, who's a senior biometrician and senior manager from Western Ecosystems Technology, Inc. based in Laramie will talk to us about appropriate ways to analyze peak count LEC data in his presentation entitled Trends in LEC Attendance by Male Greater Sage Grouse. And I'll go ahead and this time I'll move the slide. Go ahead, Ryan. All right, thanks, Tom. Well, um, other folks involved in this project include uh, Lyman McDonald, Jason Mitchell, Shay Howland, and Chad LeBeau. Um, those, that list is, is either uh, biometricians or sage grouse experts at West. But um, I should also make it clear that, um, that Tom was also heavily involved um, in this analysis in terms of making sure that we had the right data and the data was in a consistent format that we could work with and that we understood all of the nuances of the data collection, storage, and interpretation. That was a big task. I'm sure Tom spent hundreds of hours on that, you can imagine. Um, all this data, historic data, coming from multiple sources and multiple people. Um, next slide, please. So um, trends in greater sage grouse breeding populations are typically indexed by determining the peak number of males attending a lek within a lekking season. And numerous studies have estimated negative trends in sage grouse breeding populations over time. Um, via that data collected that Tom's been managing from 1965 to 2015. Now, WAFA bringing in West to analyze this data was really just to provide another look at the data and get an independent look. Um, you know, it's, it's often good to analyze the data more than once and using um, several different methods to make sure that there is some sort of a, agreement in uh, the interpretation of the data. Next slide, please. So our objective was to determine what we believe is the most appropriate method for estimating trends in the male segment of the greater sage-grouse breeding populations within seven habitat management zones, and then provide an example of the analysis using the historic data collected from 1965 to 2015. Um, 
as a part of our report, which I'll talk a little bit about later, we also compared our analysis with a few other methods that have been applied to at least a portion of that historic data from 1965. But um, I'm not going to be focusing on those comparisons today. Next slide. So um, our basic approach to this analysis uh, involved, I think, three key ideas. Number one, keep the analysis assumptions to a minimum. Number two, avoid transformation of the data if possible. Uh, a wise statistician once told me, don't transform your data, transform yourself, which means transform your ideas about the data and how it could be analyzed. And um, the third sort of big point that, that we wanted to focus on was we wanted to follow individual elects through time while still being, being able to estimate trends in peak male attendance for various regions and across the entire study area. Next slide. So WAFWA provided uh, West with elect database compiled from individual state agency data sources from the 11 Western states within various management zones that itemized the number of peak males observed on monitored LECs from 65 to 2015. We defined a LEC as a point-based display site with a fixed geographic latitudinal and longitudinal coordinate at which two or more males were counted in two or more years, sometime between 1965 and 2015 based on early morning surveys conducted between 15th of March to the 15th of May. In addition, um, from larger LECs and potentially spatially related satellite LECs or activity centers, we combined those using a spatial clustering analysis that separated LECs and activity centers that were more than 1.2 kilometers apart. But counts within the resulting 1.2 kilometer LEC clusters were combined into what really should be called LEC complexes. So this analysis was really based on LEC complexes and not individual LECs. Next slide. <clears throat> there um, were a couple of nuances of the data that we really had to uh, try to figure out how to address. Um, for example, there were many zero values for peak male counts at many individual LECs in the data provided by WAFWA or to WAFWA by the individual states. Now those zeros could represent a multitude of scenarios which were impossible to distinguish. For example, a zero value for a peak number of males may have indicated that a LEC was not surveyed in that year, meaning it really should be represented as a missing value and not a true zero. In other cases, a zero could have been an artifact of a LEC being surveyed only once within a season and the timing or conditions of that one particular visit were not ideal. Another scenario could have, been, could have involved multiple visits to elect within a season, but no males were ever detected during those particular visits. So um, what we decided to do was reduce the string of consecutive zero values collected over subsequent years from the database because the cause and interpretation of those zero values was ambiguous. And we did not remove the first zero at a LEC following a count of male attendance in an attempt to avoid the confounding factors mentioned above. Um, this approach minimizes the potential for mixing various sources of zero values. So in this particular case, for example, we would have kept the 14, 5, 9, 11, 4, and 0 count. And then at the end of the string, we would have kept the 0, 3, and 5 count in the analysis. Next slide. <clears throat> the analysis approach that we thought was most appropriate um, given the data was one that has been peer reviewed and published several times by, you know, Thog Martin et al. and um, myself, Sauer and Link from Patuxent, uh, Brian Millsap from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Next slide. It's, um, this approach is actually a, a Bayesian hierarchical model that uses um, uh, over, over dispersed Poisson distribution to model the counts of peak male um, or peak male counts at LEX within each season. 
within each year. The trends in the actual peak numbers of males at ELEC may vary over time and space. Uh, for example, localized areas may support stable sage-grouse populations, while larger geographic extents of sage-grouse may experience population declines or increases. This Bayesian hierarchical approach allows us for modeling of trends at various scales simultaneously. So we can model the trends at an individual lek, we can model trends within a particular management zone, and then we can also model trends across all management zones simultaneously. So the hierarchical model included both fixed and random effects. Um, and again, it was similar to approaches used to estimate trends of different species in, for example, the breeding bird surveys and Western Wide Golden Eagle surveys that have been conducted for the Fish and Wildlife Service for the last 10 years. Following model runs for all management zones, we calculated range-wide estimates of trends using a weighted average of individual estimates of trends for each management zone model. And these weights were based on the proportion of LECs monitored in each zone. We then calculated 90% credible intervals, which are essentially the equivalent of um, a confidence interval, but in a Bayesian format. And we decided that if a 90% credible interval for a trend did not include zero, that it was statistically significant at an alpha value of 0.1. So next slide, please, Tom. So here are the various management zones. <clears throat> um, we ended up combining zones two and seven in our analysis because there have been very few LEC complexes that have been identified and monitored uh, over the last 50 years. Uh, next slide, please. In our analysis, um, we did, this, we did the, um, the trend analysis on three different levels. The first uh, level was to uh, monitor trends in what we called core areas, where 75% of the average peak count from LEX um, that were monitored between 2010 and 2015. So in a way, you can think of those as the strongholds, at least during that five-year period. We also ran the trend analysis for the periphery areas, those areas outside of that pink 75% core. And we analyzed the data for trends within each entire management zone, uh, which was essentially the core and periphery areas combined. Next slide. So before we start looking at results, I just want to <clears throat> kind of remind everybody as, as to um, what I'm talking about when I, when I mean, or when I say the word trend. Here, as a hypothetical example, we've got the average peak number of males per lex starting out at 30 in year 1965. And you can see the difference between a 1% decline per year and a 2% decline per year and an average of a 4% decline per year. So over a 50 year period, a 1% decline per year could reduce the average peak number of males per lek from 30 down to 18 because it's such a long period of time that we're monitoring. So let's look at some results. Next slide, please, Tom. So uh, we detected declines in sage-grouse breeding populations, or, or at least the peak number of males attending LEX across the current range of sage-grouse, um, similar to the other analyses that have been applied to this historic data. Here is the result for Management Zone 1, the Great Plains. We see that LEX in core areas experienced less of a decline compared to LEX in the periphery areas. and logically, uh, the combined core and periphery tended to be an average of those trends. And we'll see that as we quickly scroll through the other management zones. So next slide shows management zone number three, the Southern Great Basin. And the next slide, management zone four, the Snake River Plain. And then management zone five, the Northern Great Basin, 
and then management zone six, the Columbian Basin. And finally, management zones two and seven that were combined, again, uh, because of a um, very few number of LECs that had been monitored um, in management zone seven. And then next slide, range wide. Again, a general decline <clears throat> and consistently less of a decline in the core areas compared to the periphery and the combined trend analysis was kind of an average of the two. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so on average, there was a 1.3% decline per year in the core area across the seven management zones. But I think it's kind of important to recognize that if we, if we ignored zones one and six, there was less than a 0.9% decline every year. Uh, and zones one and six were the Great Plains and the Columbia Basin, respectively. Next slide. So I, I mentioned that it was important to us in our analysis to be able to not only estimate trends um, for particular management zones and range wide across all management zones, but we really wanted this analysis to do a pretty fair job of tracking trends for individual LECs. So here's an example um, of 16 LECs across the different management zones. We just randomly pulled these out and the red lines show our modeled estimates of trends over time. The gray dots are the actual counts of the number of, uh, the peak number of males at those LECs within each year. Now you can see that um, the red lines are tracking the general scatter plots pretty well, but I think it's also important to recognize that <clears throat> um, we have various amounts of data for different LECs. Many LECs didn't come into recognition, I don't want to say existence, but they weren't monitored until later, maybe starting um, in the mid-2000s. But overall, um, our, you know, looking at several of these plots, we believe that our model fit the data fairly well. Next slide. <clears throat> um, we also wanted to... Um, make a point that, you know, given the cyclical nature of um, sage-grouse populations, um, when you, the data that you use to analyze uh, for trends in peak male counts um, can be really important. For an example here, we just analyzed data from 2005 to 2015. Now we see the same, I guess, ranking of those trends and that there was less of a decline in the core area, more of a decline in the periphery, and the average was, um, uh, or the combined was kind of an average of the two. But if we just look at the last 10 years of data, we see a steeper decline in the number of males attending LEX. Next slide, please, Tom. So some limitations of this analysis, and I think of any analysis regarding this historic data. Number one, we have to recognize that there has been varying survey effort within management zones and states and between years within management zones and states. We believe that uh, <clears throat> that effort has been more consistent since 2007, um, but Still, the, a main point is that um, this monitoring has been somewhat opportunistic, uh, especially in the early years. There has not been a systematic sample of potential LEC sites um, since two, uh, 1965. Some people question whether or not the early years were focused more on larger LECs uh, simply because of their availability the, the ease of seeing a larger LEC compared to a smaller one. Another limitation of this analysis is how zeros are handled. Uh, whether or not you admit, or sorry, um, whether or not you ignore all zeros in your analysis, or you only keep the first zero after an actual count, uh, 
and then the first zero right before a count greater than zero. All those things could affect the results. We did end up conducting the analysis um, both ways where we ignored the zeros in the middle, kept the last zero after the string of positive integers and the first zero before a string, um, again, in this example, before two and six. And we also conducted the analysis where we retained all zeros for that analysis. And um, the analysis that retained all zeros ended up showing even steeper declines in the peak number of males attending LEX um, during the season. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. <clears throat> we um, were not able to account for incomplete probability of detection during these surveys, but that seems like it would be a very difficult thing to account for. Um, given the typical survey protocol that uh, has been employed in the last 50 years. Most, most methods accounting for probability of detection do require some type of closure assumption, which I think uh, would be a tenuous assumption at best in most scenarios, unless there is a major change in the survey protocol. So that might be something that we have to live with, or maybe collectively we can come up with an idea to solve that issue of imperfect probability of detection. Now, has the number of sage grouse decreased over time? This may or may not be evident in analyses that have been conducted so far that estimate changes in the peak number of males observed on a lek. Although analyses may claim that the number of peak males on a lek is a good index or a proxy for population abundance, Differences in sampling effort between states and over time makes it difficult to say that state databases of LEC counts accurately represent the true trends in abundance of the species. Now, to complicate matters, West has seen abundance of other lecking species, for example, lesser prairie chicken, expand. So we've seen abundance increase for lesser prairie chickens, while the average cluster size of birds observed has declined, meaning the peak number of males on individual LECs has declined, but overall, the population is seeing an increase. So many of the uh, LECs consistently monitored over the last 50 years, again, were based on a judgment or a convenient sample and not part of a probability-based sample of LECs. Additionally, survey effort at many individual LECs has been inconsistent over time, as I've mentioned. But despite problems associated with the collection and, and analysis of this LEC count data, I think these data sets uh, represent really the only long-term available data that we've got for analyzing trends in uh, the sage-grouse populations. The next slide, please, Tom. Um, <clears throat> so given the limitations in the historic data, Wes believes that the best approach for retrospective looks at peak male LEC attendance is the Bayesian hierarchical model um, that I briefly described and is described in more detail in our report. That report can be found on the West website, so that's west-inc.com, and I believe on the WAFWA website as well. I think uh, um, one thing that, that Tom and Paul and I have been uh, just recently discussing is giving everybody the opportunity to analyze the data the historic data using this Bayesian hierarchical model that we developed. And uh, um, I know that Paul, at least, is working on developing a very nice, friendly user interface, and uh, hopefully we can add this analysis to that dashboard so that um, you don't have to feel like a programmer if you want to analyze some of this historic data. And the next slide, please, Tom. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> future analyses, you know, I, I think a, a really good approach to monitoring um, sage grouse populations in the future would be a range-wide population abundance survey, either during, you know, during the winter or the breeding season. Um, and those monitoring efforts and data storage should be consistent over time and space. 
but this range-wide population abundance survey should not just include historic known LECs, but it should also be searching for LECs that have not yet been identified. So more of a systematic or a random uh, sample of LECs over space. Obviously, um, if we were going to change how LECs were monitored over time or the population of greater sage grouse, uh, a pilot study might be helpful so that we can check some of our assumptions and identify the most appropriate analysis for that data. Some of these surveys could involve some new technology like um, infrared. But the primary objective should be to develop a monitoring protocol that is consistent over time and space and data storage and interpretation that is also consistent over time and space in between states and, and biologists. But again, whatever we develop, we should keep our assumptions, our analysis assumptions to a minimum. And even though it's my third out of fourth bullets, I wanted to mention that uh, I think developing regional resource selection functions to identify key landscape characteristics could be a very useful tool for management. It could help us to stratify and increase our survey effort in some areas versus others. Identify strongholds and um, identify habitats where our conservation efforts um, could be best put to use. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ryan. Um, Sage Grouse Select -like Database is certainly being asked to do things it was never really designed to do. And I think you guys have sort of shown us one way forward in terms of analyzing past data. Um, one of the things we're going to be asking of LEC databases in the future is to um, use them to evaluate the uh, effectiveness of BLM uh, land use revisions and, and uh, all of us evaluating our effectiveness of our own conservation practices. So our next speaker, Dr. Paul Lucas, a professor at the University of Montana, is going to talk to us about improving population size and trend estimation in greater sage grouse. And, Hopefully we can uh, meet the requirements of the BLM and others. So Paul, go ahead. All right, thanks Tom. And uh, thanks Ryan for introducing a lot of the LEC issues. So we can sort of carry that idea forward here into my presentation as well. Um, this is work I did with uh, Rebecca McCaffrey was the postdoc working on a bunch of this work. And uh, Josh Nowak is the lead programmer in my lab and is doing a lot of the interface uh, development. Next slide please Tom. All right, so we went into this project with three main objectives. One was to think about how to improve sampling design for LEC counts and sage grouse sampling in general. Um, second was to develop an integrated population model to uh, describe population trajectories. And then finally, design user-friendly software to implement the analyses. Next slide, please. So our approach was first to think about LEC counts. and and how we can rethink the use of let count data to improve abundance estimation. So as Ryan pointed out, there's lots of inconsistency over time, things like unknown zeros and other things like that, and differences in number of counts per LEC. Um, and then some ideas of whether it's more important to survey a lot of LECs a few times or a few LECs a lot of times or something in between. So we wanted to think about that sort of sampling problem we wanted population models that could combine multiple sources of information. Uh, so there's LEC counts over a broad temporal and spatial scale, but there's also lots of research studies and some focused efforts on things like nest data and uh, wing collection from harvest, telemetry data, all sorts of other sources of data that might help improve the way we consider sage grouse population models. And uh, finally, we wanted to develop easy to use software so we can capitalize on the power of shared computing. So a lot of these analyses take a whole lot of computer power to uh, fit big Bayesian models, uh, especially when we start bringing lots of LECs together. But we want it to be easy to use so that you didn't have to get a couple extra graduate degrees just to run an analysis. So you could just sit down at your computer when you got uh, done with your various other tasks and be able to analyze the data fairly easily. Next slide, please. All right, so as Re Rebecca was working on this, um, 
she suggested n mixture models as a possibility for analyzing let count data um, and then kind of sought to test the idea because it kind of pushes a bit on some of the assumptions on n mixture models but the sort of basic idea of an n mixture model is there's a biological process going on driving uh, grouse abundance per lex we can think about the population size at each lec and then model lec abundance perhaps as having some trend function or environmental variation and then also share information across lex on average lex size next slide please and then we observe these lex with lec counts and so we need some observation of this uh, this process used to observe data um, and so we know we missed some grouse due to detection probability issues and so we could model that detection probability as possibly a environmental effect and maybe it's weather issues or observer issues um, to get an, an estimate of, of detection probability that comes from having multiple counts per lec and so when we're thinking lec counts here we're thinking about having multiple counts on each lec during sort of the peak season um, so this may be applicable to some past data but not necessarily applicable to all historic data uh, so one thing to keep in mind all right so some key features here is it allows variation in lex size as a function of environment also allows variation in detection as a function of observer or lex specific characteristics um, we know that lex are vary in, in uh, number of lex both the number of birds on the lek, which is the process end of it, and our ability to see those birds. So we wind up with these really variable counts over years. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we wanted to test whether the N mixture models adequately estimate the abundance, and then if they do, then what's the right amount of sampling frequency? Should we go to leks a lot or not so much, and can we skip some leks entirely across years? Next slide, please. All right, so we look at the results. So on each of these graphs on the x-axis, we're going by proportion of missing data. So on the left side, that means we go to each lec multiple times. And then as we go right on this, uh, on each graph, then we're dropping out 10% of the data on each. So there'll be, when we get out to, the far end of 90% of the data dropped out, that means a bunch of LECs aren't counted at all, and some LECs only have one or two counts. Um, so if we look at population growth rate, the end mixture model does a good job at es estimating growth rate. We just assumed a 5% uh, decline here from our simulated uh, analysis. When we start getting out at 90% of the data missing, it really starts to, to break down in uh, bias there. Or not really, it's still unbiased, but you start getting all sorts of really terrible estimates. Um, detection probability, we assumed a detection probability of 0.5 and did a great job of, of estimating the detection probability. That didn't vary all that much bias wise as missing data started coming in. And then started starting abundance, um, started to pick up some bias as it got to 70 and 90% of the data missing. But still, if we're, if we're only getting about half of them of the LECs counted, it's still doing pretty good on all three of those measures in terms of bias-wise. Next slide, please. Then we wanted to look at uh, precision. So we start going from, again, on the left, from no missing data out to 90% missing. And we had uh, detection probability variable by year. Uh, precision doesn't get hit all that hard until we get to about 50% missing. So uh, when we get out to 70 to 90, it really starts to break down. But what this suggests is we can really be cutting back on the number of LECs that are being sampled every year and kind of rotate through them as long as we get some repeated counts on the LECs. Um, some of the LECs, we can, we can start uh, skipping LECs across years to some degree. Next slide. All right, so a quick case study. So we used LEC data from Montana from 2002 to 2014, uh, where we had multiple counts per LEC at some LECs. Not every LEC was uh, counted multiple times every year, and not all LECs were surveyed in all years. So this has a lot of the standard issues that you'd expect in, uh, in LEC count data. And when there wasn't a survey 
done, we assumed uh, that those values were missing values rather than putting a zero in or something like that. All right, so we can look at how, in the Montana example, how detection probably varied by year. Um, and it was quite variable. So we look at 2007, detection probably was almost 0.8, whereas 2014, down closer to 0.2, so almost a fourfold variation in detection probability across time and, and widely variable. Next slide, please. Then we can look at how lex size changed. So both of these graphs, the black line uh, indicates the, just the peak male uh, uh, count per year, and the blue line is the end mixture model fit. Um, and on the left side, it's just estimating a, a different annual mean per year for the lex, and the right side is if we fit a trend model through the um, mean lack count size per year. Uh, you can see that in some cases, the even let, allowing it to vary by year, uh, the end mixture model gives a fairly different view of what was going on than just the lack count data, the raw lack count or high males did. Next slide, please. Uh, so we believe the end mixture models are useful for, for improving uh, estimation for black counts. In cases where all we can get is repeated counts in time, uh, it does have the advantage of including detection probability and allows us to bring in things like covariates on both detection probability and mean lek abundance. Um, and it also gives us a way to guide sampling design so we can think about how precision and bias break down as we get less and less sampling um, and definitely suggest we should could skip sampling some leks in some years, as long as we keep them as missing values in our, you know, in the database, so really careful data storage is needed there to distinguish between missing and unsampled lex uh, and zeros, uh, and suggest that we definitely need to sample some lex multiple times within a year in order to estimate that detection probability. All right, so then we wanted to take the abundance estimation from lack counts and think about it in integrated, bring it into an integrated population model along with other sources of information. And so when you're thinking about other sources of information, there's survival information, recruitment, um, possibly from nest surveys, things like that, and um, sex ratio information that might come from wing barrels or other sources like that. Next slide, please. Um, so, one thing we wanted to think about was let counts seem to overestimate the amount of variation in abundance. So there's a, a lot of sampling variation and grouse moving on and off lex and things like that that winds up popping up in the counts. Um, and so we have the, IP, the integrated population model. It allows us to smooth through a lot of that variation uh, in the let counts. One of the biggest limiting factors we found was the absence of sex ratio information, um, and that really limited the ability to make insights to total population size from the integrated population model. So most of the population size beyond that that came out of the males being estimated on LEX um, really was assumption-based on a limited amount of information on, based on sex ratios. Next slide, please. All right, so if we look at the Montana populations again. If we look at the left side graph there, that's an integrated population model and the results looking at population growth rates um, based on raw lek counts only. And then if we look at the right side, that's if we brought the end mixture model into the integrated population model, um, we can see that we wind up smoothing out a lot of that bounce uh, from, or not a lot of it, but we get some smoothing of the, the, of the bouncing that goes on from the extra amount of sampling variance in the raw counts. Um, and get a bit better estimates when we bring in the, the end mixture model. All right, so both end mixture models and integrated population models require some fairly intense Bayesian uh, computing to estimate. So we wanted to provide some easy to use software for that. Um, 
and sort of as a larger project in my lab, we developed this POPAR um, population modeling and, and wildlife sort of data work, uh, workflow software. And so what POPAR does is allow for easy interchange between databases of things like lect counts or telemetry data, centralized databases in, into uh, complex Bayesian analyses and then provide reporting out the back end. Um, so we leveraged some of this interface development we've been doing, brought in the integrated population modeling and the end mixture models into that um, to allow it some easy to use software. The other nice thing is it's web-based, so you don't need to install anything on your own computer. You don't need to um, worry about updates and things like that. All that is handled on our end on our servers. Next slide, please. Um, so POPR allows these uh, fairly intuitive interface where you can pick the database you're working with, the state you're working on, or if you're uh, working at a different spatial scale, you can grab uh, populations or other things. And we're actually, is one of the follow-ups to after chatting with the um, Waffle Risk team, uh, going to be adding in a GIS layer upload where you could inter intersect a, a GIS layer and pick the region you want it to analyze rather than just a course thing like I want to analyze Lex in Montana. So it allows you a way to subset Lex, pick a year range, um, and then decide how you want to set up your, your population model, do the Bayesian analyses, and then click run. It sits and runs on our big server here at the University of Montana, and then spits back the results to you. Next slide, please. And it does the same thing with, with the um, N-mixture model. So the previous slide showed the IPM. This is the N-mixture model, so pretty similar setup. You pick your set of LEX, hit it to run. It turns out that these N-mixture models take a long time to run. Um, so just sitting there and staring at a website for several hours is not too exciting. So it allows you the option to uh, put your email address in there too, and it'll send you a report uh, in your email whenever it finishes. Next slide, please. Um, and then you'll get plots back like this. So the, the gray uh, shaded region shows the 95% uh, credible interval on population size for the population. So here the data ended in 2014. You can see predictions into the future. Um, your credible intervals grow very rapidly as you start moving into the future. And then the blue dots below show the estimated uh, male abundance from the and mixture let count information. So brings out kind of summary information like this, both plots and tables and reports. Uh, next slide, please. So just a summary on the IPM stuff. It provides a, a framework to consider multiple uh, for data collection and uh, then uh, guide synthesis, these multiple data sources. So often biologists kind of have a mental synth synthesis going on in their mind. They've got some lect count data, maybe some telemetry data from some nearby study, and they need to, and they just kind of mentally synthesize it all. It's not so easy for human brains to do those sort of mental syntheses. So this allows a way to uh, formally bring together all those sorts of data, handling all those sources of uncertainty into one common analysis. And then POPAR provides this nice workflow to simplify the modeling process and the data storage and uh, all the data connections so that the data wind up in the right form for the analysis. Next slide, please. So just sort of overall summary, um, it seems that from our simulations of evaluation of the N-mixture models, it's better to survey uh, more lack type that in backwards. Uh, it should, we should be surveying less, less frequently in time, but several times per year. Uh, yeah, let's restate that again. Uh, so it's, we don't need to survey all LEX every year. It's better to survey a few LEX well. Um, and then the population models allow us to reduce that sampling variance in the population trajectory. Um, definitely a clear need for sex ratios 
we want to think about overall population size. Um, and then PopR gives us this easy to use web based software that can uh, allow biologists to have pretty easy access to analyzing their data. All right, I think that wraps me up. Yeah, that's the end on my side. Thank you, Paul. Um, one quick comment on the significance of this. Whether it's uh, Pete Coates' IPM in the bi state or what Paul's doing with graders, we're, we're moving. Um, the exciting aspect of this is we're moving from an index, our convenience sample uh, with no confidence limits, uh, to ask, actually estimating the number of sage grouse out there. The end mixture model um, estimates the number of males, the IPM brings in other information to expand that to the entire population and the opportunity to bring in covariates to explain some of this. And I, I think it's it's a really exciting um, direction it, in a manner that states can access it and still protect it and manipulate it without having to have advanced degrees in statistics. So um, this is exciting, but uh, we do have some time for questions and I'll turn it over to Mary to uh, bring those in. Yeah, um, we have some time for questions, and if, uh, some folks have figured it out already. Um, you can just type in your questions into that questions pane on the under the control panel on the right side of your monitor. Or type them in. Um, if you know the presenter's name, um, please include that. If not, no worries. And um, I'll, as the questions come in, I will read them to the speakers. So I'm going to start off. Um, some questions came in early. Um, for, uh, I believe it was Michael. Um, the first question is from Todd. When will the MarkSan modeling be done? Well, we're doing two things uh, with the project. The first is we're doing an initial cut of our um, approaches to modeling, and that's going to be done by June. Uh, so coming up here really quickly. And we're also developing a cookbook approach, sort of, uh, which will display how we use the MarkSan approach in our context. And you can imagine with any modeling uh, procedure, you may think certain things are more important than I do, for example, in my modeling approach. So we're going to also be developing a sort of a cookbook that allows you to sort of a tutorial on how to use the MarkSan tool within a couple of different software packages. One is ArcGIS, one is Arc, I'm sorry, uh, ArcGIS, and the other one is R. And so that will also be available by June as well. Um, so people can use that and, and put their own spatial layers and kind of mimic what we've done and add in some additional complexity or uniqueness as they see fit. Thank you. The next question is also for you, uh, Michael. Um, Jennifer is asking, will the other greater sage grouse areas be mapped and available on the SGI website in the future? She's interested in areas in eastern Montana and the Dakotas. So we are doing a, a little bit of additional mapping. We're doing some additional mapping in Colorado and Wyoming that were not displayed on um, my map on one of my slides. Um, but in terms of other areas, we're not going to be doing anything additional in the Dakotas. Um, so everything that is currently done is on the SGI website, and we'll be adding the Wyoming areas as well as some additional Colorado areas on in, in the future. Uh, the Montana areas should all be on there already. Um, but in, in terms of that, I don't believe we're planning on doing any additional mapping uh, at the moment. Great, thanks. The next question is for um, Louis. It's from Kira. Uh, how can somebody obtain the fuel break GIS data? Uh, the one we created, so we provided, if I remember well, we provided that to WAFA in the federal federal compatible database. So that is public domain now. I know we deliver that to, to Tom. And so it's been also posted on um, the Great Basin Consortium uh, website with a, a hyperlink to um, the database. So that all that information can be downloaded. And I warn people, if you want to do this at home, there's a little art doing this. So you may want to consult with Nathan Welch and Bob Unash on that. Also, important detail, we propose kind of heuristic fuel breaks, likely fuel breaks, but at the project level, you may, the manager may choose to go in an entirely different area, still where there's a pinch point. So we didn't have 
you know, information on local things that sometimes you just can't do a fuel break in a certain area. And you wouldn't know that from, you know, 26 million acres who's just looking down at a screen. You just don't know that. Next question is from David. Were you able to determine any differences between pre-settlement and post-settlement juniper when looking at cover density? Who was that for? Well, I don't know. It sounds like <laughs> who, Colin. Who <laughs> yeah, who feels most comfortable answering it? You may just have to jump in <laughs> with some of these questions if we can't identify who the speaker is, and that's fine. So if you're talking about juniper density specifically, wasn't that my not to be a volleyball player here, but wasn't that Mike? Yeah, but he didn't have a historical perspective. He just looked at recent imagery. I think you were the only one that had done anything uh, looking back. Sure. So we can right right now the uh, we can only go back as far as the the satellite archive allows us to do. Uh, best case, that's 1983, and in extreme circumstances, 1972. So that's as far back as we can go at this point with the the, the kind of products I overviewed. Yeah, and I don't recall that you mentioned uh, conifers specifically in your presentation. Right, we do collaborate. So the, the same stuff that I showed you, we collaborate with the forest service to do a per pixel tree canopy estimate it would be broader than what Mike talked about. You know, it's including mountains as well. And same, same goes for that. You could only push that back to about 1983. Okay. We don't have any more questions in the queue, so I'm going to wait a second and see if we get a couple more. Um, I will ask anybody in the audience if they would like to um, answer or ask a question by phone or computer mic. If you're interested in doing that, you can just raise your hand. Um, I, I think you just click on your name or click on that little icon, the hand icon, and then I can unmute you. No one's raising their hand, so let's go back. I don't have any other questions in the queue. Um, in the meantime, maybe somebody's in the process of formulating, but in the meantime, do you guys have any um, anything you want to add that perhaps maybe you forgot or wanted to emphasize on some of the key uh, parts of your research? Because we do have a couple more minutes if you'd like to. Susan, uh, I, Mary, I have a question for Michael. This is Louie. Okay. So it's not polite usually for a presenter to ask another presenter a question, but I do have one. And I can't find the raise hand thing, so. <laughs> okay, you're unmuted. Okay. Uh, Michael, um, you're mapping trees and location of trees. Uh, it, um, what I would caution is that in some parts, in large parts of central Nevada, actually in central Nevada, in eastern Nevada, the resource selection function of sage grouse um, for nesting and brood uh, nest success, also uh, travel to brood rearing habitat. The trees are a neutral contributor. Unlike other parts of uh, the range of the species, they're a negative contributor, but in our part of the world, uh, below the Columbia Plateau rim, pinion and juniper are neutral contributors, whereas cheatgrass, annual grasslands, and early successional habitat, and degraded late brood habitat are, are negative contributors. So if you're going to put your money somewhere, you're going to put it in cheatgrass and in brood rearing habitat, improving it. It's much cheaper and it has a higher return on investment than putting in trees. And that, I, I would, the, the caution I bring is that I don't want people thinking we have to go mow every tree. That's $600 an acre in our part of the world for a mastication, stuff like that. Whereas it's $280 an acre to fix an annual grassland. So there's a huge difference in return on investment. Yeah, so I appreciate the comment. And I guess that sort of highlights the second comment I had on my the answer to my last question. You know, so we're we're doing this initial uh, Mark Sand optimization work in Oregon, and we've kind of thought out some of the, the consequences and inputs there uh, very carefully. But as you just pointed out, that's going to vary between, uh, depending on who you are and where you are across the region. And so 
part of us developing that cookbook uh, approach to the Markson modeling procedure so uh, people can take that and put in their own costs and their own um, benefits as they like and, and using existing data sets, be able to do their own modeling approach to optimize cost and benefit um, given their specifics. Curious, Louie, do the uh, sage-grouse tolerate trees or better in Nevada, or are there the uh, They actually, the birds, the trees have, abs so it's lost nesting habitat because there's trees there, especially if there's a lot of them. But there is no relation, there's a neutral relationship between nest success and uh, tree cover. And also, in Nevada, the birds, if they're between the nest site and the brood rearing habitat, there's trees and a mountain to go over full of pinyon juniper. Collared birds have been followed. You know, the, the researchers walk behind the birds, and the birds go through miles of pinyon juniper to get to brood rearing habitat because water is critical and the resources are there. And it, we're not quite sure, well, not me, but UNR, the folks at University of Nevada, we know, Jim Seninger and company, they don't know quite why. It's because the predator levels are less in pinyon juniper, but also the critical habitat is up there, and if the chicks don't get there in time, they'll die. So the birds, the hens, and the chicks walk miles through um, pinion, thick pinion juniper. They don't care. And they've been tracked, and the tracking shows they're going through it, and, you know, so they do it. Amazing how, I mean, we've, we view them as very uh, narrow niche, but they actually seem to tolerate a pretty diverse suite of landscape characteristics and figure out a way to make it work. Actually, the fish and wildlife are kind of recognizing now that the birds of central Nevada that are behaving differently than the Idaho, Wyoming, and California populations. Nevada and Utah have a lot in common in their behavior, especially in the southern parts in the central and all that. Well, Tom, uh, we don't have any more questions in the queue, so do you have any final closing words and then we can wrap this up? Well, the only thing I would say is I would thank the panelists not, not only for their presentations today and for staying on time, and but the, the entire time they, uh, these projects were uh, um, really wonderful to coordinate because they made my job incredibly easy. They're very professional and, and did great work, and I think we have moved the needle on sage-grouse conservation because of their efforts. And, you know, we're, we're maybe not quite there in terms of an entirely collaborative approach that's seamless across agencies and sharing of data, but we're a lot better off than we were in 2012. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Tom. Um, so in closing, I just would like, personally like to thank the speakers, and including Tom, Michael, Louie, Colin, Ryan, and Paul for their presentations today. I'd also like to thank the audience for attending the webinar. For those of you who came in late, I will send everybody a link to the recording as well as um, to the PDF slides and any other resources that are provided to me by um, the presenters. Maybe there's some other things we can pass along your way. And so I'd just like to wish everybody a, a good day and um, hopefully we'll see you on our next webinar. Goodbye. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Bye.